thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today and for the opportunity uh, to speak. The Bible tells us that God planned for salvation long before the beginning of time. The church, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 and 11, was in the eternal purpose of God. Jesus himself was foreordained before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. In fact... Jesus stands as the Lamb slain before the beginning of time in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. God, you see, knew that man would sin, and God as well knew that in sin man would need a Savior. And not only did He know those things, He cared enough to make a plan by which man could be saved. And throughout history, throughout the Bible, God revealed His plan to redeem mankind. The ancient Israelites knew a little bit more than some of the patriarchs. And some of the later Israelites during the times of the prophets knew a little bit more than the earlier Israelites. And then the early Christians knew more than than those Israelites. And now today we have the fully revealed Word of God in the Bible. But as God began to reveal His plan, He started in Genesis chapter 3. At almost the very first point of man's sin... God begins to reveal what He is going to do to offer salvation to mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, and specifically in verse 15 that was read for us, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Certainly, even in the book of Genesis, God will go on to reveal more about his plan to bring forgiveness to the world. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 and verse, through verse 3, he tells Abraham that he'll make a great name of him, that he'll make of him a great nation, but then he says, and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It was through Abraham that Jesus would come. And specifically then later in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, God, through Jacob, said that the scepter would not depart from Judah. Jesus would come through the tribe of Judah. And so God begins to reveal more and more. But when we look at Genesis chapter 3, God already knows. God knows what He plans to do to bring salvation. And if we look closely at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we can learn a number of different things that God already had in mind, that He, he already began to reveal to mankind when man first sinned. For example, God reveals here even that salvation would be God's work. Now understand, I'm not saying that we don't have a part in our own salvation, that we don't have to be obedient to God's plan. But God reveals that ultimately salvation would be His work, that it would be His plan that would bring forgiveness into the world. At this point in time, when you think about Adam and Eve and mankind as a whole, man had just begun to realize that he even had a problem. Perhaps you remember what Adam and Eve did after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The first thing they did was they tried to fashion themselves with clothes made of fig leaves and to hide themselves from God. 
which of course were both futile. God giving them clothing of skins of animals later and also God knowing exactly where they were. Man, just begin to know what sin was and what a problem sin would be. Man was in no position to deal with his sin. But God already knew. God already knew that He would send Jesus into the world. God already knew that Jesus would give His life for salvation. God had a better plan. God had a real plan. And He had already conceived that plan. You see, salvation would be brought about by God and through His plan. He initiated the plan, He conceived the plan, and He would complete the plan. At the beginning of time, when man first sinned, God already knew what He would do. Salvation would be God's work. God would bring it to be. But we also, if we notice closely, and we think closely about who God is talking to and dealing with at this point in time, we also really realize that salvation would be for all nations. At this point in time, in Genesis chapter 3, God is not yet dealing with a specific nation, a specific group of people. It's going to be thousands of years until... God speaks to Abraham and tells him to leave her of the Chaldeans and to go to a land that he would show him. It would be hundreds of years more before God would lead the ancient Israelites out of Egypt by the hand of Moses. At this point in time, God is speaking to Adam and to Eve, the father and the mother of all humanity. And through them, the problem of sin would spread to all the world. Through Adam, Paul would say, all men sin. The need of salvation because of that sin would thus include all people as well. And of course, God intends for the salvation of all people. From the very beginning, God was concerned with each and every person. And today, He's still concerned with each and every person. He's concerned for you and He's concerned for me. Later, of course, he would be more specific and reveal how salvation would concern all people. As already mentioned in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, he promised that through Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed. And so he becomes more specific. And then when we come to the Great Commission, Jesus commands the disciples to take the gospel into all the world and to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we would see that occur in Acts chapter 10 as Peter preached to Cornelius and to his household. But even at the beginning, all the way back here in Genesis chapter 3, when man and woman first sin, God already plans to bring salvation to all nations through Jesus. God just didn't intend to save Israel, but He planned to save all. We sing a song sometimes that says, Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go His grace. The gospel is for all. God intended that from the beginning. If we look closely as well, we also see that salvation would have a miraculous aspect to it. Look again at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God says to the serpent again, He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In the midst of that verse, God says to the serpent, there will be enmity between your seed, that is the seed of Satan, and her seed. Later in the book of Galatians, Paul will make a point from the exact wording that God uses here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. And he'll say, God didn't say to seeds as to many, but to seed as to one, which is Christ. God was talking about Jesus here. And he was talking about how Jesus would be the seed of woman. 
course, we know from the New Testament that what God is suggesting here is that salvation would in some way circumvent the natural process of human reproduction. That this Savior that God would bring into the world would come in a way that people aren't normally conceived. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Isaiah would foretell that the virgin would conceive and give birth to a son whose name would be Emmanuel or God with us. The process would involve the seed of woman but not the seed of man. In Luke chapter 1 in verse 34 and verse 35 as well, Luke points out that Mary, Jesus' mother, conceived Jesus in her womb without the aid of a man. And so Jesus was indeed the seed of woman and not the seed of man. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 34, Luke tells us, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? How can she have a child? Since I do not know a man. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. All the way here in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God already intended for the conception of Jesus to be miraculous. That Mary would conceive without the aid of a man. But that intends or implies another aspect of this miraculous idea. Not just that salvation would come through the, through the seed of woman, but if we look very closely at what Luke says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, God also intended that salvation would come through God. Look again at verse 35 and look at it closely. The angel tells Mary, he says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, God knew that Jesus would be the seed of woman. He knew that a human man was not going to be involved in Jesus' conception. And that tells us that He knew that God would be involved, that He would be involved. Now Luke tells us in verse 35 that because God was involved in Jesus being born, that He was not only man, but He was also, as Luke says, divine, or He was God. That is, that this Savior that God would bring into the world would be human and divine, or God. John said in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 in that same chapter, he said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was not just human. He was the seed of woman, so he was human, but he was more than that. He was God as well. And God knew that. From the very beginning, God knew that Jesus would be conceived miraculously through the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, God actively and miraculously brought about salvation into the world. When we think about that, that ought to overwhelm us. Because God, when man sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God didn't have to do a thing. God hadn't forced man to sin. Man had chosen to sin. And every one of us since Adam and Eve have chosen to sin as long as we're old enough to know. God didn't have to do a thing for us. But He chose to. He could have let us flounder in our sin. He could have let us suffer the consequences of sin. But instead, He chose to act. And He chose to to send His own Son, Jesus, is the seed that God foretold in Genesis chapter 3. But if we look closely again at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we'll find that not only would this salvation be brought about through miraculous works of God, but also that salvation would come through suffering. 
Look again at verse 15. He says about the seed, there will be enmity between the serpent's seed or Satan's seed and her seed, the woman's seed. He, that is the seed of woman, shall bruise your head, shall bruise the serpent's head, and you, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. What God's talking about here is, is suffering of varying degrees. The seed of woman would be bruised on the heel. That means he's going to suffer, but it's not going to be fatal. It's not going to be triumphant or complete. The suffering would be temporary. It would not be decisive. The seed would still be around to bruise the serpent's head. We know, of course, what God is talking about because of the fuller revelation of God. We know that He's talking about the crucifixion. That, that Satan would bruise Jesus on the heel. And perhaps he might even think that he would be triumphant. But of course, Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead victorious over death and over Satan. Jesus indeed suffered. And God planned for that suffering before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, He planned to send His own Son, the seed of woman, to die upon the cross. You see, God knew that sin required a sacrifice. And He knew that when man would sin, that man would need a sacrifice. But the blood of bulls and goats wouldn't be enough. The blood of some animal wouldn't be sufficient to take away the, seed of, the sin of man. Sin required blood. Sin required punishment and death. And sin required the sacrifice of Jesus. Man needed a sacrifice. And before God founded the world, God had already planned what He would do to bring about that sacrifice and to bring about the salvation through that sacrifice. Also, if we look closely again, we'll see that salvation would be destructive. At the end of verse 15, God reveals to the serpent again, He shall bruise your head. The serpent, of course, would bruise the seeds heal. He would cause suffering to the seed. But that suffering would be temporary. It would not be decisive. However, the seed would bruise the serpent's head. He would deliver a crushing blow to Satan. The seed's suffering would be temporary, but the serpent's, serpent's suffering would be decisive. Salvation, in other words, would result in the destruction of the serpent. The serpent, of course, being Satan. Through the seed, God would destroy Satan and would destroy sin as well. The seed would be victorious over the serpent. Jesus, indeed, through the suffering that He endured on the cross, has done that very thing. In the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 14, the Hebrews writer talks about the power of Satan. And he says in verse 14, he says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That is, he came and became human. He took on flesh and blood. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is, the devil. When Jesus died upon the cross and then arose over death victorious, he destroyed the power of Satan. And he destroyed Satan as well. And someday, at the end of time, when Jesus returns again, 
God has a place prepared for Satan and his angels. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. He has the place of hell in which he'll cast Satan. God, through the seed, has destroyed Satan and his power. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Salvation. God revealed from the very beginning would be offered to all people. It would bring salvation, or He would bring salvation through His seed, through His own Son. And through the suffering of that seed would bring it about. And that suffering and that sacrifice of his seed would bring the destruction of Satan and of sin and of death that man needed. But God did much more than simply plan. He brought it into being. Perhaps more importantly than just planning, he acted. He did what he planned. He did what what we needed. He accomplished what we couldn't. When Adam and Eve first found themselves in sin, when they first found that they had done wrong against God, God already knew what he was going to do. God already had a plan. God already had a way of redemption and salvation. He didn't have to bring it about, but He did because He loved us and because He wanted a relationship with us. This morning, that salvation that God began to reveal back in Genesis chapter 3 is available to every one of us. God offers us the forgiveness of sin through the sacrifice of Jesus. This morning, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one. By by coming to Jesus, believing that He is the Christ, the Son of God, (coughs) repenting of your sins and confessing that you believe that He is the Christ, the Son of God, before men, and being willing to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the plan that God had in the beginning. That He would offer forgiveness through Jesus and through obedience to Him. This morning, if you haven't done that, why not? God devised this plan because He cared enough for us. Because He cared at the very beginning and He knew that we would need a way of salvation. And if God loved us so much, why wouldn't we obey Him? Why wouldn't we do His will? Perhaps this morning you've done that. You've come to God through Jesus in obedience, but perhaps you've fallen short of God's will. We encourage you this morning to repent, to make right those things that you've done wrong. Perhaps this morning you need the prayers of the church. One of the great blessings of the church is that we can pray for one another and we can encourage one another. And I'm certain that everyone here would love to pray for you this morning. And so if you need to come to Christ to receive that salvation that God offers through Him, or if you need to return to Him in repentance, won't you come? When you think about all that God has done and that plan that He devised from the very beginning, before we even knew what sin was and the consequences of it. Knowing that, won't you come as we stand and sing?